country over face two problems. They're all trying to enlist the services of the nation's top schoolboy court star, Wilt Chamberlain from Overbrook High School in Philadelphia. Since Wilt's seven-foot frame can only be spread over one campus, it's inevitable that if the coach doesn't get him, someday he'll have to stop him. The lanky seven-foot star, appropriately nicknamed the Stilt, is modestly proud of holding the Pennsylvania State three-year scoring record, a major factor that has sicked untold numbers of college and professional scouts on the trail of this youngster. Overbrook High School usually gets off to a good start, for Wilt the Stilt has never lost a center jump. And in just a limited number of steps, Chamberlain is down court riddling the enemy basket with his deadly one-hand push shot. A defensive demon, Chamberlain puts away three consecutive scoring attempts, a tantalizing talent that generally sends opposing coaches away from the game, talking to themselves. as the slow motion camera magnifies the wealth of this schoolboy's abilities. First, Chamberlain steals the ball in midair. Then, with a combination of expert dribbling and coordinated speed, the stilt moves up court, setting up a give-and-go play that nets his high school teammates another two-pointer. Dead eye at charity throws, Chamberlain draws many opportunities to demonstrate his accuracy from the foul line. But most fearsome of all is the Wilt Chamberlain dip shot. Just a pass from a teammate anywhere near the basket and Wilt does the rest. Among the stilts bag of basketball tricks is his personal feat of making himself unguardable. All it takes is a flick of the wrist and three opponents wither in horrible frustration as Chamberlain scores again. The camera slows the action and we see Wilt at his deadly best. This type of prolific scoring has caused collegiate coaches to raise many an admiring eyebrow. Wilt the Stilt and his back-breaking dip shot were a welcome sight to Overbrook High for the combination helped bring two city championships to the Philadelphia school. Wilt is still a growing boy. Needless to say, the efforts of this young man have not gone unnoticed. Because of Chamberlain's defensive and offensive ability, the schoolboy star has been included in the nation's top high school five for an unprecedented two years in a row. When Chamberlain is not shooting fouls, he's covering them for his teammates. And when they're not shooting fouls, the stilt goes on scoring anyway, a most welcome talent to say the least. Now Chamberlain must trade his high school cheers for the plaudits of college fans. And the big question is, which school will become the lucky one? For the stilt, high school days have been glorious ones. There's no telling what future laurels will soon rest on the shoulders of lanky Wilt Chamberlain. Well, I probably was a better player in high school than I was in college. Uh, in high school, uh, our team went 15-0 and, and to the city championship. In college, I played for Josh Cody at Temple, and uh, I had a couple good years. One year, I tore two ligaments, and I was out for a while. Uh, some games I started, some games I didn't. I was fairly good. They would say I was very aggressive. I drove well to the basket, and I had a good outside shot and played terrific defense. The basketball was my life. I loved it. I could play it 24 hours, 24 hours a day. I played in the snow. I played in the rain. And we played on three times a day. It was my whole life, basketball. First of all, I got a scholarship, which was great because I couldn't afford to go to college. And to play for Temple University it was the dream of my life. Unfortunately, we didn't have a very successful kind of coach. And uh, we had a mediocre season, a couple seasons. A couple seasons we did very well. But to play basketball at Temple was everything I ever dreamed of. No, it never occurred to me that I was going to be a basketball coach. Uh, I graduated from Temple in phys physical education, and I got a job at Overbrook High School, and I worked closely with Sam Cozen, 
who was Wilt's 10th grade coach. And uh, in fact, I became his athletic director at his camp. And through his association, when he got a job at Drexel University, the position became available. And Sam Cozen was the one who really instigated the athletic director to give me the job. I had never coached before. Uh, probably they all knew that I knew basketball, and I knew basketball very well. And my close relationship with Sam Cozen was the one that swung it for uh, the, the athletic director, Ben Ogden, to give me the job. Well, I didn't get it until September. They didn't decide until after the summer. And I was uh, away at camp. And I got the call to be the basketball coach at Overbrook High School, and I really couldn't believe it. It was a dream beyond all dreams. And uh, I was so excited that I didn't know where to go and what to do and who to talk with. Well, I knew I was getting Wilt, and I knew I was getting a good team. And I had played against Wilt in independent basketball. We knew each other. And I knew that this was a chance in a lifetime and something that every coach would ever dream of getting. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I went to Overbrook High School as a student, and I played basketball at Overbrook High School. It was a combination of a Jewish community, an Italian community, and an African American community. And they integrated well. And it was very thought of as Overbrook High School and basketball were synonymous with excellence. I probably didn't sleep well at night any nights, knowing the excitement of coaching Will Chamberlain, knowing that he was going to be the best player ever at that time, and the excitement of coaching Will. And with the other players, we had an Ira Davis on the team, who became the Olympic Hop 7 jump champion for uh, United States in the Olympics. And uh, we had uh, Vincent Miller, who was six foot six and a great player. And I knew that this was going to be an exciting time in my life. Basketball was all that we had in the 50s. High school basketball and college basketball was the beginning and the end of the universe in Philadelphia. Unbelievable. I think it was probably the basketball capital of the world next to New York. They had ball players left and right. Will lived on Salford Street. He was right in the heart of West Philly. I first met Will, it was 1951, in junior high school. I said, my God, look at this guy. He's just a big skinny kid. Didn't know a lot about the game yet. He didn't have much of a game in seventh grade, but I would say eighth grade, ninth grade, you could see it coming. First time I bumped into Wilt, this tall, rangy kid was at a side basket, laying finger rolls in the hoop and doing adroit foot moves. So I said to the director of the center, I said, who is that kid over there? He said, that's Wilt Chamberlain. You're gonna hear about him. Everybody was talking about Will Chamberlain. And I remember just before we graduated, he said, Jimmy, what school are you going to go to? I said, Overbrook. He said, that's where I'm going. I said, well, I guess we'll win a lot of championships then. Percentage-wise, I guess it might have been 60% Caucasian, 40% black. Overbrook was a good academic school, and it was always noted for its basketball because we had talented Jewish and black players. The gym was very small like a band box. The end lines on each end were the walls. They had mats against the wall. So if you touched the mat, you were out of bounds. And the stands are almost right on the line. When you're playing, the girls would tickle you. <laughs> Up top, it was all steel. You could see the glass. Things coming down like rings and ropes. So it was almost impossible to throw a full court pass. With a team like we had, we should have been playing in a big, modern-looking gym. But it gave us an advantage because we had Will. All right. They pass the wheel? Yeah, of course Well, I've been coaching him for two years now, and I marvel at just watching him play. But this is our system on defense. We uh, put Wilton in the center underneath the basket as just protecting the basket. His ability to block shots and to get about two feet over the basket is our wonderful asset for having him there. I he see blocks, what you mean. <laughs> he blocks numerous shots as you can see. His strength is uncanny for a tall boy and his agility is the same as our number 21 over there, Little Marty Use. Offensively, we try to get the ball to Wilton in order that he may be overguarded by two or three men. And if he is overguarded by two or three men, he can pass the ball out to some of our other team players that are clear. 
Mm -hmm. If he isn't guarded by two or three men, he will take a shot. And if he misses, he will dunk it himself on the rebound. Well, the court makes the little team that much bigger. When he first came into the school, he used to work out with our team, and uh, we were amazed to see somebody that tall. He used to slope over, and he wasn't too proud of his height at that particular time. I don't think these doorways were ever built for me, and I'm always constantly ducking. I guess he felt like a freak in a way. They're always pointing fingers at him, looking up in the air and wondering who he was. He was so much more than just a big guy. He was an athlete, probably the first of his time, who was not only big, but grace with athletic ability. You can start the fast break and will be the first one down the court. He just looked like a gazelle, you know, just like, you know, slow rolling. Will would have been a good player if he were six foot five. He was well coordinated, he was agile. He just could do most of the things that smaller people could do. I just sat there with my mouth open half the time because I never saw somebody as big as he is do as many things as a basketball player. Something special to watch. He had a flair. He liked to do things where people would say, wow, look at that. I saw him several times on defense where somebody took a shot and he would just grab the ball out of the air with one hand. Before Will Chamberlain, no one dunked the ball. He was so strong, so devastatingly strong. You give him the ball, and he would just jam it, and if you were in his way, he'd take you in the basket, too. Will was a good student. In French class, he was always doing very well. He was well-liked at Overbrook High School. The girls loved him. People were in awe of him, and the crowds came out in throngs just to see Will play. He was the dominant athlete in the United States at 17 years of age. By senior year, he was very full of himself because the world was full of him. Life magazine did a spread when I was a senior in high school in which the nation's tallest basketball players were featured holding the ball up under the rim and through the net. And I can still see that spread. It's still formidable in my mind. We were inundated with photographers and reporters. UCLA said, we'll make you a movie star. Other schools offered him scholarships to become a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer, whatever he wanted. The number one player in the country was going to be offered everything and anything. This is Dave Keeler. I'm with Cecil Mosenson. And we're watching what's widely considered the greatest high school basketball game ever played. It's 1954, and Overbrook is playing at Farrell. Coming into this game, Farrell was the defending Pennsylvania state champion. And Overbrook was the defending Philadelphia City champion. Philadelphia teams in those days did not play for the Pennsylvania State Basketball Championships. Overbrook's in black. Farrell's in white. You can see it's a full house, about 3,500 people crammed into Farrell's gym. To see this showdown on December 28, 1954. This is Will Chamberlain's senior year in high school. And Will gets a block. This is a home movie, extremely rare footage. And it's been restored by Cecil Mosenson. And it shows, without question, Will's greatness as a high school basketball player. In a tremendous game, against an outstanding team. That's Charlie Kemp shooting for Farrell. All the Farrell players shot underhand. Farrell was coached by Ed McCluskey, who's the most successful high school basketball coach in the history of Pennsylvania. His teams at Farrell won a total of seven state championships between 1952 and 1972. And Wilt with the ball amazing agility and shot. Farrell hadn't lost a game at home at this point in nine years. They came into this contest against Overbrook on a 74 home game winning streak. It's a tough place for visitors, Cecil. Farrell spreading the court, trying to 
find lanes for driving and shooting from the outside, there's a hook shot. Doesn't have a chance going up against Will. What they wanted to do is suck Will away from the basket uh, so that they could get offensive rebounds. On defense, Farrell collapses on Will. Wilt was 9 for 15 from the foul line in this game. He scored a total of 33 points. Another outside shot and a tremendous rebound. Off balance by Wilt Chamberlain. He was bumped while he went up for the ball. Wilt was in foul trouble early in this game. Uh, Wilt and Jimmy Sadler both had three fouls at halftime. put back by Overbrook. In a game where Farrell had jumped out to a quick lead, Overbrook quickly got back in the game and it was close throughout the second half. We're seeing the second half here. A lot of contact under, under the basket. Now the rules of uh, basketball permitted what now is called goaltending. In 1954, when this game was played, the rule was changed specifically because of Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt was so good around the basket that the uh, goaltending rules were put into effect. That's 37-36 in favor of Farrell, with about four minutes left in the third quarter. Another thing you'll notice in this game is that the foul lane is much narrower than, uh, than the foul lane is in contemporary basketball. The lane was widened specifically because of Wilt. Two important rule changes in basketball were made expressly because of Wilt Chamberlain. He was too good underneath the basket with the narrow lanes and so the lanes were widened. There's no other major sport played in the United States where two major rule changes were made because of one player. Pass inside to Wilt, catch and a dunk. Fouled on the play. Three point play. Notice how widespread the Farrell players are. There's a running hook, the only shot in basketball for which there's no defense. And for some reason it's a shot that's uh, fallen out of favor. You never see it in contemporary basketball. Athletic rebound by Wilt. Looping pass to Chamberlain. Yeah, there's a jump shot that we didn't want Will to take because he couldn't get the rebound. So we, uh, at a timeout, we indicated to him that he's not to take that shot again. Well, on the foul line, hits the free throw. One of the ways that Farrell prepared for this game was in their scrimmages. They had one, one of the fellows on the team hold up a broom to simulate Will Chamberlain on defense. Here, Overbrook is up 44-43 with a little more than a minute left in the third quarter. And Wilt's on the foul line. That shot's good. A very easy free throw motion for Wilt in high school. Farrell tried to draw Wilt away from the basket. Good ball movement. And a great drive. I believe that was uh, Jim McCoy who made that basket. Here's a nice shot by Marty Hughes and Wilt's patting him on the rear. Wilt was a good teammate, Cecil. Outstanding players, too, and three of the guys on the court in this game were at one time or another 
first team all state players in Pennsylvania they were. Jim McCoy, Pete Hall, and their big man, six feet four Don Jones. Wilt doesn't like that call. And uh, generally, Overbrook did not get the best of the calls in this game. Wilt had four fouls in this game in, in his whole career, uh, playing three years through the high school, never had more than two fouls, two fouls against him. As a pro, Wilt Chamberlain never <coughs> fouled out of a game. Look at that ball handling ability by Wilt. Farrell pressed in this game, and Overbrook's strategy in breaking the press was to get the ball into Wilt to set the offense in motion. Long outside shot, easy rebound for Wilt, who was fouled on that play. Farrell really crashed the boards in this game shot over a leaping Chamberlain. I think that's the only one in, in this film where someone shot over a goat. Going into the fourth quarter, Cecil, what did you tell your team? Well, we wanted to make sure that the press didn't affect us and the ball got to Wilt in the right place, and then they brought the ball up so the ball could get into the corner and make a pass into Wilt. We wanted to get the ball to Wilt underneath the basket. This film was taken by the parent <clears throat> of one of the Farrell players and going into the fourth quarter in this packed Farrell gym the home team is ahead of Overbrook 50-48 Farrell again bombing from outside having trouble getting those rebounds. Well, when you shoot a ball from the outside, it hits the rim and bounces way out so that uh, it's easy for the other team to retrieve the, the ball. That's one thing you see in contemporary basketball. <clears throat> a lot of three-point shooting teams partially negate the strength of the defense and rebounders. Time out here, Cecil. What, what were you telling your team? Yeah, we had to make sure that the passes were too well at the right place and that the passes had some speed on them, that they weren't just lobbed too well. That's Paul Gustus shooting the foul shots there. All the Farrell players shot their free throws underhand. Gustus ultimately would hit the winning shots in this game from the foul line. He scored eight points in the game, all free throws. Smothering defense by Farrell. Farrell's off the ball defense in this game was much tighter than college teams played in 1954. Long outside shot and a tip in by Farrell. See, that's the kind of pass we wanted him to make. Tremendous catch and finish by Will Chamberlain. His balance is amazing. 17-year-old big man didn't have those skills in 1954. Nothing like this had ever been seen in high school basketball before Will Chamberlain. Disciplined Farrell team. Outside shot misses. One handed leaping rebound by Wilt. Wilt catches the ball in the air. Now that would be goaltending in contemporary basketball, but that goaltending rule had not been put into effect at that point. This game was really won on the foul line in the fourth quarter by Farrell. It's a shot by uh, Charlie Kemp. 
There were a lot of questionable calls by the uh, officials on the Farrell court that uh, upset my players. shot that does not go in will successfully defend it down. Uh, trying to get the ball into Wilt, but uh, that was a bad pass. And that bad pass resulted in a fast break layoff. See, so what were you telling the team? 56-56 with two minutes left. Well, I wanted him to know how much time was left and how to move the ball. Uh, so that uh, we would get a good shot at that time. Farrell scores their last three points in this game on the foul line, ultimately winning 59 to 58. And as I said before, a lot of the calls were very questionable. There's one of we look like. We were fouled, and they're shooting a foul shot. That's a miss. <laughs> Tremendous agility by Will. Ball stolen. It's a bad pass. But Will immediately defends, preventing a fast break. This is Paul Augustus on the foul line, shooting for Farrell. That, that looks good. Will brings the ball down court. Look at that ball handling. Farrow players swarm around him. Brook was unable to get the ball inside. 45 seconds left. It's 57, 56. Farrow, timeout. Cecil, what did you tell the team? We had to get the ball to Will from the out of bounds, and we wanted to make sure the pass was at least 12 feet high. And their two players just sort of squashed next to him, and we couldn't get the ball. Tip in makes it 59 58. The scenic Catskill Mountains in upstate New York. If you were part of New York City's middle and working class Jewish families in the 1950s, chances are you spent some of your summer at resort hotels like Grossinger's and the Concord. It was also the last place you'd expect to see a seven foot black teenager from Philadelphia. But that's exactly where you'd find Will Chamberlain. And he was not alone. Each hotel had a team made up of college players, high school players, ex-pros who worked at the hotel during the summer. Great summer jobs. The best program was at Kutcher's Country Club, which had Red Auerbach coaching. I was the athletic director up there with Red Auerbach, and I told him about Wilt that he would be a good bellhop. Your sports commentator drove up to New York's Catskill Mountains to look in on tall timber, basketball timber, and the person of Wilton Chamberlain. He works as a bellhop, this seven-foot, one-inch giant. He can still grow, they tell us. 
A senior at Philadelphia's Overbrook High School, Chamberlain is an A student. The college and professional hoop scouts are hot on his trail. Even at those hotels, he was a major attraction, and it was a good place to be seen. One day we finished practice and this guy starts talking to Wilt and after 15 minutes the guy leaves and I asked Wilt, who was that? He says, that was Abe Saperstein of the Globetrotters and he just offered me one third of the Globetrotters if I'd sign with him. It was a match made in heaven. The Harlem Globetrotters and the eighth wonder of the world. So Wilt left Kansas and signed with the Trotters for the then astronomical sum of $65,000. When a reporter pointed out that was more money than the president made, Will joked he deserved it and said he could jump higher. He got a very good offer from Abe Saperstein to join the Trotters, and he stayed with them for a year. And actually, for many summers thereafter, he would go to Europe with the Trotters and play with them. He gloried in going to the Globe Trotters because he could show that he could play that kind of basketball. Will wanted always to exhibit his diversity. They had the whole comedy thing going with Metal Arc, and then Will was kind of like a counter to that being the most dominant big man in the game. They would go into that weave of theirs, and they'd go in and out and everything, and then Metlock Lemon would drive down the lane and flip it over his head. And wherever he flipped it, Wilt was right behind it, and he got it and he came in with these gargantuan dunks, and people would go crazy. At that time, to see a guy dunk was amazing. Wilt was the show. He was what everybody was talking about especially the men who ran the NBA. At that time, our owner was Eddie Gottlieb, one of the founders of the league, very influential in the league. Eddie Gottlieb was the mogul. That's what he was called in Philadelphia. Gottlieb decided he wanted Wilt. He wasn't going to trust the draft, and I don't know who he conned, but... Eddie, together with the other owners, decided it would be in the best interest of the league and the teams if they could have a lot of players from their own area. He wiggled away in there because Wilt had played his high school ball in Philadelphia, and he became the territorial peck of the Warriors. They tried that, now they'd run it out of town. The mogul was a, a master, that kind of stuff. Well, Eddie Gottlieb is mighty happy to have you, a member of the Philadelphia Warriors. Do you feel that you are ready for this? I think there will be a period of orientation for me across like it is for every newcomer in the NBA, but I think in the long run, I'll be able to handle myself man to man with almost anyone in the league. When Wilt came in, it was basically the dark ages of the NBA. They played in armories, they played in gymnasiums. Some of the places they played, it would be freezing cold. Take them to halftime before they break a sweat. You know what the biggest draw in the NBA was? It was the Harlem Globetrotters. The Globies would come in, play the first half of a doubleheader, and they packed the place. And then the home team would play in the second game, and half the crowd would go home. Will was one of the greatest shots in the arm that the league could possibly have, especially in Philadelphia. Where Zinkoff, every time that Will dunked, he had a saying, Dipper dunks. It was frenzy. People didn't flock to these games to see George Mikan. Mikan was a big man, he was a good ball player, but everybody wanted to see Will. It really was the circus come to town when the Warriors would play basketball. Their phenomenal rookie star, Wilt Chamberlain, supplies most of the scoring punch to the tribe attack. Will has been averaging 39 points a game. He came into a league where no one had ever averaged 30 points a game. He averaged 37.6 for the season. It's like a rookie in baseball that year had come in not hitting 62 home runs, but 79. He shattered the record. I think he scared people. He scared the opposition, he scared the other owners. They thought, my God, what are we gonna do with this guy? He can come in here and score 35, 40 points of will. And that's just what he did. Winning the league's Rookie of the Year and Most Valuable Player Awards while leading the Warriors from last place to the NBA playoffs. When you talk about the greatest basketball player of all time, Wilt should be in a discussion. Michael Jordan hasn't come close to doing what Wilt did. Did you ever do any of your work on ice skates? No, not this year, not this year. Next year, maybe not this year. People forget 
that he was also a dominant track star. There wasn't anything athletically that Wolf could not excel at. Is it played indoors? Yes. Is it basketball? Yes. Wilt the still? <laughs> Who's Will Chamberlain? He was a true genuine American hero. He was the most dominant presence that I've ever seen. There was just this sense of hugeness. Of all the people who ever played the game of basketball, Will Chamberlain stood head and shoulders above the rest. The Big Dipper, Wilt the Stilt, a man of enormous appetites and colossal ability. I have in my possession a signed contract for him to fight Muhammad Ali. I mean, that was actually going to happen. I'd accept your challenge as soon as I'm finished with a few more contenders, if I beat them. Well, then I can't get your signature on that line, but I... Just hold your pen. Don't rush things. How we'll long? Soon. <laughs> how long? Just, just quit pop. Don't, don't start popping off. I'm not popping. I'd like to know how long. When you start popping off, you'd be in trouble. Now, I'm going to take it easy with you. Just be cool. But you can't tell me how long, though, can you? A man can only wait so long. His personality. I want my man, bro. His individuality. Wilt Chamberlain clears the bar at six feet six inches. All of that went in to make him larger than life. Why are you driving a rap? Because it has more headroom than my Rolls Royce. And a lot of big guys ain't lovable, I'm afraid, you know. But he was. It's TWA's new ambassador class to the East Coast with enough room for anybody. Even if you're seven foot one. Or taller. It's taller. Little. Even with his massive frame, his big beaming smile, and that 4,000 points in one NBA season. When it comes to someone being dominant force in the game, and his name is mentioned first. The year that he said, I'm going to lead the league in assists, he did. I don't care if you're playing against midgets, that's a lot of damn rebounds, you know. I knew that Will was eventually going to score 100 points in some game. He scored 90 for me in high school in 28 minutes. And uh, he had 15 points in one minute in, in the high school game. So there was no doubt that one day, if a coach allowed him to do it, he was going to score 100 points. And it was the most exciting thing that anybody ever heard of. Yeah, and he was, he was matter of fact about it. He says, oh, it was 100 points. I've scored 80. I'd scored 70. And, you know, I just scored another couple more points. Oh, absolutely. How could it not mean, you know? And if somebody got 101 points in the next game, he would go out and get 102 points. He wanted to be the best in every aspect in, of, of the game, and uh, he was. You know, it's, it's impossible to describe. There was no way of stopping him. He could shoot and score by dunking the ball every time he wanted to. And there was no way of just uh, understanding uh, what the Knicks were trying to do. It was impossible. Unfortunately, it wasn't televised, you know, and Bill Campbell was uh, such a terrific announcer that he made it very exciting. And when he got 96 points and 98 points, and then when he scored the 100th point, the crowd went crazy. Everybody jumped up and screamed. It was the most exciting thing that anybody ever heard of. I watched him closely. I watched everything that he did. He always put out 100% in whatever he wanted to do, whether he just wanted to be an assist man, or whether he just wanted to get rebounds, or whether he wanted to score, or whether he wanted to do all those things. And I could sense when he really was in the game, or when he was just going through the motions. The two memories really are the city championship games at the Palestra with 10,000 people in the stands, uh, beating South Catholic, who was coached by Jack Kraft, and then beating West Catholic, and the excitement of being a, an undefeated uh, city championship team is something that will live with me forever. And that how all five players played as a team. And it wasn't just Will Chamberlain, but it was all five players that participated. And the love of the players and my love for them that has lasted over the 50 years. None more striking than the one he pulled off on a cold and dreary winter night in Hershey, Pennsylvania in 1962. Nobody wanted to go to Hershey. Players didn't want to play there. It was a home game played away on the road. So everybody was a little annoyed to begin with. It was kind of a slapstick night. I remember too the locker room. The locker room was terrible. 
It was just a big room, a lot of brown benches set against the wall, and you had a row of wooden planks on the wall with spikes out of them that the players just hung their clothes on. It was very austere. The shower room was small. I think there were two or three shower heads for all of us. It was a hellhole. <laughs> but for three games a year, it was home for the Warriors. It started to be a magical night from the beginning. Will loved to go, whenever he went to Hershey, loved to go into the arcade. I must have put three dollars and quarters in. He was shooting clay pigeons and he couldn't miss. Bing, 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 bing. That could have been an indication of something unusual was going to happen that night. By halftime of that unusual night, Will scored 41, although that figure hardly raised an eyebrow. Will scored so many points and so many games that year that I didn't even know how many points he had. He was awesome from the foul line that night. Bing, bing, like it was automatic. 28 for 32 was unreal. Good God, sometimes would take him 10 games to hit 28 three throws. That was really the impetus for his having a great game. When he got into the 60s, I decided to alert the PA announcer, Dave Zinkoff. I think we ought to call every point that Will gets over the PA system. Chamberlain for two. Chamberlain has 71. He's within two of the record. The excitement was the fact that Chamberlain had 73 in a regular game and 78 in an overtime game. They're announcing the new record of 79. And during the announcement, Chamberlain goes right ahead through the announcement and makes a foul. They're still making the announcement. He makes another foul. We started to get excited the last several minutes of the game. He shoots this. Good. Ah! His shot off the backboard that night, I'd say, accounted for most of his points. One minute and one second to play, he has 98 points. Rogers throws long to Chamberlain. He shoots, no good. The rebound, Luckenbill. Back to Chamberlain. He shoots up, no good. In and out. The rebound, Luckenbill. Back to Ruckwood. Lucky for me, Wilt was open, bumped his man off his hip, and said, woo, which meant, I'm here I am, and I flipped it to him. The people that were there just rushed to court. <laughs> it was a wild scene. The most amazing scoring performance of all time. 100 points for the Big Dipper. It was an exhibition of great art and skill, and that's the way I've always remembered it. I grabbed a piece of paper, wrote 100, and he set up this picture, and the guy from the AP got the best picture. I shook his hand, I saw him holding that piece of paper, but there was no wild celebration. It was just not that big a deal. The winning and the losing of the game was secondary to New York. Their whole object was not to let Wilk get 100 points. By the time we got to two minutes to go, it was a sure thing. There must have been 46 or 47 seconds remaining in the game. People just ran out of the stands just to touch Wilk just to be there. To so watch Will Chamberlain every single Sunday. <laughs> the Big Dipper. The sense of size in Will Chamberlain is, is the essence of the man. It's just there. You just feel like you're in the presence of some giant. You really can't tell how big he is until you actually see him. I mean, he shook my hand and my hand disappeared and, and I'm just going. I don't believe this. Averaged 50 points a game for a full season. 50 points a game. Passed off a shot that appeared to be three feet above the basket. And Will jumped up and caught this ball with one hand. The referee called goaltending. And I hollered at him, how could you call that goaltending? And he says, guy, what I just saw is not humanly possible. He never fouled out of a professional basketball game in his entire career. He was the only guy that could change the landscape in basketball, change the rules. Offensive goaltending, defensive goaltending. He had to widen the lane. The free throw shooter had to release the ball behind the line. Wilt could take off from the free throw line and dunk the foul shot. 
It's almost like the game didn't happen. A hundred points in Hershey, Pennsylvania, in the middle of the winter. The most amazing scoring performance of all time. 100 points for the Big Dipper. Well, that's the end of the game. Teachers at West Philadelphia's Overbrook High School have a message they want all to know. They will miss their most famous alumnus. Walking through the halls, Wilt Chamberlain's high school basketball coach, who has returned for the first time in many years to remember his star player. Chamberlain's senior year, when the team went 60 and 1, winning the city championship. Wow. Coach Cecil Mosenson made a pilgrimage to the school's gymnasium where Wilt the prodigy played. In four steps, he could go from one end of the court to the other. It's incredible. Brings back a lot of emotional memories. Overbrook's very important to him. And wherever he went, he always wore an Overbrook jacket or he wore his, uh, something that identified Overbrook. And uh, uh, of all the years and all the wonderful experiences he has, and I'm sure Vince will tell you this, that the Overbrook years to him were probably the greatest years. This is the cover of a book that is now out, written by Cecil Mosens. It is about Wilt Chamberlain. It all began with Wilt. Cecil was uh, uh, 22 years of age, the coach at Overbrook High School in 1952, and there is a classic shot. What, what, what's this shot? As we welcome you, by the way, Cecil, to the program. This, this shot of you and, and uh, Wilt. What, yeah, what, this what's shot of, of Wilt and me is, uh, he was being presented with an award and a plaque from the Philadelphia Inquirer. And uh, there was another p person on the picture that we sliced off. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be Phil Jasner, would it? it, would, it would, it Phil was Jasner my, was, was. I was a, just a child. You were just a child, a mere child. Phil Jasner was a counselor in my camp. Is that right? A few that years is, ago. That, that is true. That? A few years ago. <laughs> so, I, you know, give us give us some anecdotes about what you bring in in this book and kind of uh, letting everybody know about Wilt the player from his early years. Well, there are a lot of anecdotes that people don't know about. Uh, little things that happened between Wilt and me. Uh, as, he, as he was a junior, he was creating some problems and trying to grow up. There was one time when uh, he scored 71 points against a team and we were going to play that team again. And in practice, they were fooling around. I said to Wilt, you can't fool around. And at 22, I, had, I was different then. Mm -hmm. I've mellowed. And, uh, <laughs> He said he didn't do anything, and I said, well, you're off the team. And uh, I asked him to leave the practice, and we practiced without him. And I went to the principal, and I said, I just threw Will Chamberlain off the team. Uh, you better prepare a press release. I think he was ready to faint. How about a riot? Not a press release. How about a riot? <laughs> and he said, well, let's wait till Monday. Yeah. And Monday, I passed him in the hallway, and he looked the other way. And, I went down to practice and Wilt came to practice and he had a ball in his hand. And he started to walk over to me and I thought he was going to hit me with the ball. <laughs> and he said, coach, would you teach me how to shoot a hook shot? And from that moment on, our relationship mellowed. Wow. It was pretty good. The best part of this for me is Cecil came to me and said, I've written the book. Right. And he handed me an essay. It was maybe 18 inches in the Philadelphia Daily News. And we talked for a while. And that turned into a chapter, which turned into a short story, which turned into a book. And there's a, a ton of stories and anecdotes in here that are, are really, really interesting and really give you some insight into not only Wilt, but what it was like to be a head coach at such a young well, age. Well, and we'll show some people some video from back in the day of a film, uh, back in the day at Overbrook. And, and, and just, first of all, the specimen, I mean, he was, he, the guy was just an unbelievable athlete. Neil, I was interviewed a few weeks ago by a New York radio station. They said he's not the best basketball player ever. He is the best athlete ever. I was looking at some of the statistics that he has. Most consecutive 50-point games, seven times. Most 40-point games in a season, 63 times. Uh, most consecutive field goals without a miss. 18 for 18. And it goes on and on and on. His credentials are really incredible. And they're trying to make a poster stamp now of him uh, in the United States. Do you think that 
you know, everyone talks about Michael Jordan, and I'm sure you're asked all the time, you know, greatest player ever. But, but Phil, put in perspective what this guy, how he changed the game. They changed rule after rule after rule. If I remember correctly, Overbrook had a play, an out-of-bounds play, where the guy inbounding the ball would just throw it over top of the backboard. Wilt would meet it at the top. There, was, there were times when guys would shoot free throws, and because the rules were different then, the ball would be in the air and Wilt would come out of nowhere and just dunk it. And if I remember correctly, did he not... I know he attempted it, to just stand at the foul line, take a running start, and dunk it, and as long as the ball went through before he came down, it was a good free throw. And they also changed the lane from six feet to what, 12 feet. Exactly. So that he couldn't just get in and dunk the ball. He dominated the game so much that I don't know that if they really appreciate what an outstanding athlete he was. I'm fascinated by the other kids on the team. Yeah. What, how did they treat him? And was he a normal kid? They treated him as if he were nothing. <laughs> Look, Ira Davis was on the team, who was the Olympic Hop 7 jump champion for the United States and was the captain of the team. And Jimmy Sadler and a few of the other, they were dear friends. They went wherever, wherever they went and never had a problem. And then say, oh, this is Will Chamberlain. We, he was just another guy. And they were 56 and 3. You were 56 and 3 during his three years at Overbrook. Who did you, who were the three losses? I only lost one. You only lost one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so, so. And, and the one that I lost was to Farrell. And to verify what Phil was saying, we were losing by one point with five seconds of play. We had the ball out of bounds under our basket, and our play was to throw the ball 12 feet high and Will would dunk it. We threw the ball 12 feet high and two guys pushed him in the stands and the two officials ran out of the court and ran away because had they called the foul, they would have been lynched. Wow, <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Cecil Mosenson, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it, we look forward to it. It all began with Wilt. It is a, a new book that is out and uh, antidotes about uh, Wilt during his day at Overbrook High School.